in um, Hood Famous Bake Shop uh, has a shop over in Ballard and a shop over in the in Chinatown ID. They're yep. doing an amazing job and and even put out a COVID. Um, they they put out a COVID readiness packet and I I don't think that's the name of the packet, but uh, it's really awesome of the way that they kind of pivoted during COVID. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Educative Sessions. My name is Li Ngo, and I am the community manager at Educative. Educative makes it easy for authors to provide interactive and adaptive courses for software developers. And Educative Sessions is a multi-episodic campaign to engage people in the developer world about their coding experiences. Today's guest is Dominique Meeks. Dominique Meeks is the co-founder of Ambassador Stories and the No Blueprint podcast. And today's talk is called An Uncertain Future automation's impact on BIPOC-owned businesses, focusing specifically on Seattle. Uh, Dominique, where are you? I am here. There you are. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, Dominique, let's begin. Let's start with your very eclectic background. Uh, where are you currently working now, and what are you doing in those uh, different activities? Yeah, I'm currently working for the City of Seattle's Office of Economic Development as a small business advocate uh, and also running a business uh, by the name of Ambassador Stories um, that does storytelling on the side. And so I, I am a, a, a small business owner, uh, entrepreneur um, that does a lot of podcasting and digital and uh, digital media consulting um, and then full time at the Office of Economic Development. I can see a lot of different uh, ways in which your activities spill over into each Absolutely. other, right? I think uh, uh, when it comes to you know community advocacy or uh, uh, working on behalf of uh, tech, uh, communities in need of inclusivity, and so you know today you wanted to talk about a, an issue that is um, ongoing, which is the impact of both what's happening in BIPOC communities um, um, in response to the COVID nineteen pandemic. And also what's been happening for much longer, uh, the increasing interest in automation within the Seattle community. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've seen from your perspective and how the community is uh, responding or adapting? Yeah, I, I think when we say the word BIPOC, I want to make sure um, I'm defining it correctly. Um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, and it's, it's sort of a, a newer term um, that centers and puts at front Black and Indigenous folks thinking about um, just the numbers wise, um, the need to, to place Black and Indigenous folks uh, at the front of that conversation. And so as we think about COVID-19 and business, um, there were a lot of Black, Indigenous, people of color owned businesses uh, that were sort of struggling in the city of Seattle and around uh, across the country um, before COVID-19 um, and a part of, I guess, to kind of go back a question of my journey, starting off as an entrepreneur, doing videography and, and storytelling, um, there was a need to be able to uh, offer resources and opportunities to those small businesses with the with the information that I was gathering. And so that's that's sort of how I got to my role at the Office of Economic Development. And so in that, um, you sort of saw this trend of like black owned business, brown businesses, indigenous businesses um, were sort of being left behind because of a, a lack of information. And so as COVID happened, it was this death blow of, of small businesses that weren't really at, in the race uh, towards prosperity um, and community wealth building in the beginning, but now we're sort of found sort of found themselves struggling to even stay afloat. And so, as we think about the need for um, the information and 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 education uh, of these BIPOC businesses, uh, we've seen um, a ton of community support, a ton of community organizations just um, coming together in, in the way that community does to to sort of find solutions. Um, to bring folks up to speed. And while um, we will see after this pandemic, the number of businesses that will no longer um, be open, unfortunately, um, fortunately, we'll also uh, 
have learned from this experience and, and also have the opportunity uh, to see a lot more engagement uh, as it pertains to small business and access to resources. I know that's kind of a long answer. So I'll try no, I mean, but at the same time, I think it's, it's, it requires that level of like complex understanding of what's happening here. And, mm-hmm. um, and I guess, you know, there's the question of how COVID has been disproportionately impacting the BIPOC community. Mm-hmm. And then there's a question of how technology is a variable in this as well. And this is really the core of what we wanted to talk about. Um, yep. So, you know, when I, I mean, I only just recently moved away from Seattle and, and Seattle is just an example of what's happening in many other cities, but um, there's this sort of uh, theory that like technology for some is a means to upward mobility and is a means for greater inclusivity or greater participation in um, economic prosperity. Um, I have questions as to whether you agree with that sentiment. Um, and I'd want I'd love for you to talk about what you think is happening when it comes to the way in which uh, Seattle is becoming more automated for this community, um, either independent of or in step with also what's happening with the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think in a in a large portion, you know, technology is supposed to be this equalizer um, that levels all playing fields, um, and I, I I'd also note that in Seattle, we're a bit spoiled, right? Um, I think that having so many technology companies, um, the biggest cloud companies in the world are right here in our backyard. Um, And so I've I've been in the Seattle metropolitan area since I was seven years old. And so having that access, um, while also thinking about um, a lot of BIPOC people across this nation do not have the same access as I do. Um, And Technology doesn't necessarily erase uh, the, the history of redlining, the history of miseducation, the history of uh, a lack of resources in education systems. Um, and I, did, I always note that um, in my own city of, of Seattle, South Seattle, um, there's a school, Rainier Beach, right down the street from where I live, that has not been renovated since 1960 something. Right. Um, I could only imagine what the computer lab at Rainier Beach High School looks like compared to the computer labs in a Bellevue school district. And again, we're right in the backyard of all of the cloud companies, uh, the biggest cloud company in the world. And I'm, so I'm, I'm sure that the computer lab in Rainier Beach High School maybe uh, is, is worlds beyond computer labs in other places. However, um, in order to keep up and be a part of the ever-growing change of what's going, what's happening with technology in this city specifically, um, folks really need access to those resources. Um, and so I, I, w- I want to make sure I answer your question. Um, and, and, and so yeah. on one hand, I think from a technology standpoint, um, it, 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 it can do a lot for the progression of equity, whether we're talking about racially, whether talking about you economically. Um, however, it, there, it's, it's not necessarily a magic bullet um, when so many humans are behind this technology, having diversified boardrooms, um, when we, we were not putting BIPOC folks, women um, in charge of hiring and management positions as well. And so I would just underline um, that's important. And then just to also double down, uh, thinking about, I always come back to pay equity, um, and also thinking about what happens to BIPOC folks and women to these positions, um, and making sure uh, that the that the pay equity is there, making sure that the the organizations and the the organizations and the technology companies and startups um, are also thinking about what it means um, to have equity in these places, um, or from a BIPOC owned startup. Uh, when BIPOC-owned startups come for rounds of uh, making sure that uh, have enough funding to get to the NAND or, or to launch their business, making sure that equity is made. And so I know that's a, a I don't want to go, I can go on a tangent forever. <laughs> I know, I know I'm, I'm trying to, I, you're all there. It's all there. And uh, um, uh, there's so much going on in these communities that w- deserve this much of attention. Um, I think uh, to make your words more potent, um, I want to, just clarify one thing you did say is, and, and yeah. if I'm, and, and let me know if I'm mistaken, is that, you know, there's all this talk about amazing technology and amazing things. And, you know, around the time that we, you and I met, um, I was uh, teaching 
um, how pe like young children, how to use voice recognition technology. Mm -hmm. But none of that mattered. I couldn't do any of that if I didn't have access to Wi-Fi, if I didn't have access to a space that was going to be safe for young people to, for two hours so they won't mm -hmm. feel stressed or harassed um, by anybody outside of that. And I think for a lot of people that don't know what it's like in, I think, uh, the areas that you work with and the areas I've worked with in the past and, and like Rainier Beach, I've done work with them, for example. And like, how, why are we talking about even like advanced automation and, you know, artificial intelligence when we don't know if the school has sufficient Wi-Fi to even sustain like Absolutely. regular research, right? Like, I, I think that's the question of inequity that uh, I would love if you think in your opinion, does automation address any of that? Or is that just like an afterthought? I, I, I do also want to, I want to know, even in your, even in your previous work, I think that the first hurdle you jumped in, and I want to make sure that it, that it goes noted, um, was your ability to meet folks where they were um, yeah. and going into the neighborhoods to meet folks where they were. And, and I, I underline that because I think oftentimes um, we build these projects and we build, build these programs and, and communities are asked to be uh, grateful that they've offered a scholarship right and and ask students to still come all the way downtown or all the way to bellevue um to come obtain this knowledge to bring back to their communities and so i do think it's important that we meet folks where they are as far as automation addressing some of these these challenges i believe it does um i think that in putting all of it together um it's sort of a slow roll i do, but i do think it takes that initial investment by someone in the community, someone outside the community, someone someone completely amplifying all of these things. But I also know that it's not something that happens overnight. Um, I think as far as from a business automation perspective, uh, on my end, I'm thinking about less about, hey, the robots are coming because the robots are here. And more so, about the automation that may seem simple to us to walk into a business and be able to use our credit cards, right? And that's, and that's beyond like, I can tap my watch and pay for something. I can tap my cell phone and pay for something now. And so if we're going into a business uh, that's cash only in 2020, all of a sudden, um, not only have you, may, you may have lost a customer that's not carrying cash, especially during COVID, um, but you've also uh, stifled your ability to make money. You've stifled maybe your ability to get a tip um, out of this situation, um, as well as the number of things that these that a point of sale system can do from an automation standpoint of connecting your small business with resources. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I do think that automation um, can do a lot, especially in the form of educating folks about what's what's uh, possible. Gotcha, gotcha. And, uh, you know, I guess maybe two things we should try to clarify. One, um, you know, what you described as a form of automation, which is just, you know, financial inclusion in a way, um, mm -hmm. might be so self-evident for a lot of communities, but for many communities, uh, they still don't adopt those things for various right. reasons. Um, right. I guess let's, I want to um, ask one more question before I try to open up to other people, yeah. but it's, the question of what are some examples of automation, in your opinion, that are potentially beneficial to the BIPOC communities? Uh, go ahead. I'll just leave it there. I was going to say, great question. I, I definitely feel like the, the point of sale system that I mentioned, um, just websites, um, claiming your Google page, claiming your Yelp page, um, just doing inventory of the number of businesses that are in Seattle that haven't claimed their Yelp page. Um, and obviously I don't work for Yelp, <laughs> however, um, the ability to the first place that you, the first, some of the first things that pop up when you Google a restaurant um, is their Yelp page. Um, and, and there's a lot of information that can be garnered and gathered there. Um, I think another form of automation uh, is just curbside. I just read an article 
about Starbucks and how they were able to continue to make profit because of their ability to allow their customers to order coffee on their app. And they started that five years ago before COVID, but you could imagine how useful that would be once COVID started. And so, as I said earlier, in, in, in thinking about the small, the small BIPOC business, um, the BIPOC owned businesses that's in Seattle, uh, and thinking about the ways that folks aren't really in this in 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 the race at all. Um, I think it's those things that start off that I that I start with when we're thinking of automation, and and we can get to uh, we can get to the logistics of your finances and your financial systems and making sure all of that later. But I think step one is just just making sure that that folks are are meeting uh, what's at tier one of making right. sure that their business can survive. Right, and I think that's a wonderful like way to at least start with a lot of the broader issues is to identify them and identify the ones that are clearly, or at least potentially clearly, uh, uh, resolvable. Right, within absolutely. our means to absolutely do so. Uh, Dominique, we are actually right up at the end of our allotted time. And I feel like you should be like several series of conversations around these issues, just so that maybe there's a particular thing that we can work on that like might appeal to one aspect of the BIPOC community or another. But this, I hope is an ongoing conversation. Uh, for now though, I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about anything you like that is a shameless plug of sorts that is near and dear to you. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I definitely want to underline the importance of storytelling, um, but I, I would be remiss um, not to give a huge shout out to BIPOC owned businesses that I feel like are are doing a wonderful job from the standpoint of automation. Um, Hood Famous Bake Shop uh, has a shop over in Ballard and a shop over in the in Chinatown ID. They're yep. doing an amazing job and, and even put out a COVID um they, they put out a COVID readiness packet, and I, I don't think that's the name of the packet, but uh, it's really awesome of the way that they kind of pivoted during COVID um, to think about their customers as well as their employees. Um, coffee shops like Bumbuna uh, over in, in, in downtown Renton, um, Umame Kushi over in Rainier Beach has done a wonderful job uh, as, as far as being a walk up, and they, and they also have amazing beignets. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, de I definitely want to shout out to them. Um, and just implore people, uh, see Seattle housing market is crazy at the moment. And so it means that, that people are moving to Seattle in droves and I want to implore people to go and visit and shop local, especially as the holidays are coming. This is, uh, the biggest time where folks receive a lot of their money during the year, please shop local, um, and make sure that you're supporting small business and local business. Uh, my heart is so like full right now because he's named so many businesses that I miss when I uh, last go to um, Seattle, um, especially like Hood Famous was a stop of mine. When they ha opened up their stop in the ID, I was like, I was there like every two days or so. And, and you can tell, you can just tell by looking in and you can tell by checking out these, these businesses that, they are focused on the community. They are inclusive of the community. And um, I also think it's the classiest thing that you didn't mention anything that you're working on at all. You just mentioned like all the things. And I don't know, I, I must, I'm a sucker for that kind of like selflessness and humility. So uh, Dominic Meeks, thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you for everyone for enjoying this as well. Uh, please keep an eye on our YouTube channel and our podcast channel for more episodes. And if you want to check out what we do at Educative, check us out at educative.io. Uh, my name is Lingo. Um, and for all of us here at Educative, happy learning. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for watching this episode of Educative Session. If you liked this episode, please like it and share with your community. To stay informed about the latest sessions, subscribe to our channel by clicking the button above. Check out our podcast at educativesessions.podbean.com in the description below. Lastly, if you're tech curious, check us out at educative.io. Happy learning, everyone.